Chapter 5 The New Normal Those first six months of therapy were the most taxing of my life. Between the older kids, the newborn, the business, and running a fully operational autism clinic, my brain was pushed to its limit. A word of wisdom to parents of newly diagnosed kiddos. It gets easier. Once systems were created and we had adopted a new set of habits, the whole clinic started to almost run itself. It was about this time that I had read Karen Sarosi's book, Unraveling the Mystery of Autism and Pervasive Development Disorder. The story in this book had a greater effect on my children's therapeutic outcomes than any other single thing we did, and I suggest that every parent of a child on the spectrum read it. Six years ago, autism was thought to be childhood schizophrenia and 100% neurological. We now know that it is every bit as much biological and metabolic as neurological, and that most children with autism suffer from intestinal and digestive problems. Sarosi wrote about her 18-month-old boy, newly diagnosed on the autism spectrum, who had red, scaly cheeks and was very thin. He was terribly constipated and ate only wheat or dairy-based foods. She wrote about how removing gluten, wheat protein, and casein, dairy protein, from her son's diet completely changed his health, to the point that, by the time he was in kindergarten, he was indistinguishable from any typically developing child. The evidence she presents is compelling, and the similarities between her son and John were striking. Looking back, there were signs of autism that we missed in the twins almost since birth, especially with John. He would cry inconsolably for hours and hours each night, for example. Just trying to get enough sleep for the first six months of his life was a full-time job. He was obviously in pain, but no amount of rocking, cuddling, feeding, or changing helped. Until the twins were about 20 months old, I slept with one on each side of me so that I could nurse them during the night. Like any typical child, Lucy would snuggle into me when she was finished nursing. John, however, would pull away and roll over as far as he could get. I was worried that he would roll right off the bed, so he had to sleep in the middle, between my husband and me. John never wanted to be cuddled, never sought attention or comfort if he was hurt, and didn't seem to notice that we even existed unless he wanted something. When he did want something, he would grab our hands and pull us toward his desired object so we could retrieve it for him. When the twins weaned, I gave them milk in their bottles, and they started to eat more solid food. John was absolutely addicted to milk and would only eat dairy or bread products. He became very thin, his nose ran all the time, and his cheeks were red and chapped. Both twins had gritty, sandy stools in their diapers. I didn't know it at the time, but all of these were markers for allergies and food intolerances and were common with autism. John was losing weight no matter how much he ate. At 30 months, he was diagnosed with failure to thrive. As his weight decreased, so did his interest in anything outside of his inner world. After reading stories about autism and diet online, we had cut back on wheat and dairy. But Sarosi's book inspired me to go completely gluten and casein-free. It was the most important decision I made considering the twins and would change the course of their lives. We installed a gate on the kitchen and locked all the cupboards and refrigerator. Nothing with even a trace of gluten or casein was allowed within the children's reach. It was hard at first, as their entire diet had consisted of the very things we were restricting. But in the end, tough love prevailed. During the switch, John refused to eat any protein-based food at all, so I had to get very creative. I boiled chicken and cut it into tiny pieces to mimic the shape of rice and mixed the two together. As the months went by, the chicken pieces got bigger and bigger until he would tolerate them. In an odd coincidence, Temple Grandin would later tell me that they used the same technique to change cattle's diet. John's dairy milk was replaced with rice milk, and by the grace of Almighty God, he would eat broccoli. He had loved anything to do with wheat bread, but he wasn't having any of the gluten-free bread. I didn't blame him. Back in 2000, rice flour bread tasted more like cardboard than bread. It is much improved now. Out of pure desperation to get nutrients into him, I created my own vitamin bars with these ingredients. Brown rice flour, pureed kale, ground flax seeds, safflower oil, 
baking powder, baking soda, egg whites, salt, maple syrup, rice milk. He was so addicted to and craving bread that he ate it, and he ate it at every meal. Rice, chicken, broccoli, egg whites, safflower or olive oil, vitamin bread, and melon were all he would eat for two years or longer. And along with a multivitamin and probiotic that I was able to sneak in was all he needed. He gained weight, his stool normalized, his runny nose cleared up, and the eczema in his cheeks disappeared. When it comes to diet, I find that parents are way too concerned about giving children on the autism spectrum variety. Kids don't want variety. They are happy eating the same thing. It is we adults who want variety. The resistance to novelty that is so common with autism can work in a child's favor in this one instance, and it makes cooking for a GFCF, gluten-free, casein-free kiddo, so much more manageable. I could make the vitamin bread on Saturday, and it would last all week. I'd whip up rice in the rice cooker and pull cooked chicken from the fridge. It couldn't have been easier. Over the following years, occasionally John would get something with dairy or wheat by accident. He would then become so locked in his own world that he was almost impossible to teach. A stranger once gave him a cookie and a glass of milk. Within 24 hours, John had broken out in hives all down his neck and back. His ears were bright red. He was so spaced out that he kept walking into bushes and would get stuck there and cry. He was completely unteachable and it took six months before we got him back in our world. Nothing we did, not even the videos, made the positive impact of this diet change. Sadly, many parents today are not trying the GFCF diet, or they aren't trying it long enough or strictly enough. You must go 100% seven days a week for at least a year to know if it is really going to make a difference. I should note that it won't be life-changing for everyone. A study presented at the 2017 International Meeting for Autism Research, IMFAR, found that 70% of children do have positive results when they go gluten and casein-free. For me, a 7 in 10 chance that my child could improve significantly is worth the effort of buying something different at the grocery store. The point is that we eventually got into a routine. A parade of therapists in the home all day was normal. A new way of cooking became the standard. Our weekends were spent in creating flashcard videos. We made it a fun family activity. My husband became accustomed to being awakened at 3 a.m. if I woke up and suddenly remembered something we needed to film. We all have routines, and some people are more attached to them than others. Starting something new is only challenging until it becomes a habit, which usually takes a month or so. It's like swimming in the ocean. The water feels positively freezing when you first jump in, but the activity of paddling and kicking soon warms you up so much that you don't even notice the cold. In fact, it can feel refreshing. 